Welcome to this webinar on optical fiber and connectors, which is in four parts. In this first part, we look at the parameters specified for fiber cables and connectors and how they impact FTTX systems. A glass fiber consists of a core where most of the light is transmitted and cladding, which is a different glass composition surrounding the core. Both core and cladding have an effect on signal propagation in fiber, with each having distinctive refractive indices, which are measures of the tendency of light to bend as it encounters a boundary. Four factors contribute to signal attenuation in a glass fiber. Scattering is the directional and time variation of emitted light caused by collisions of molecules in the fiber with photons in the light being transmitted. Its effect is most prevalent at the shorter wavelengths in the optical spectrum. Absorption is the conversion of light energy into heat energy. Atomic resonance effects at the longer wavelengths of the optical spectrum cause absorption to increase in that range of wavelengths. Chromatic dispersion, CD, effects are the result of the refractive index of the glass used to construct a fiber. They are the set of signal velocity related effects caused by changes in the refractive index of the glass fiber as wavelength changes. CD is the sum of material dispersion and waveguide dispersion. Material dispersion is caused by material specific properties that change the refractive index of glass as wavelength changes. Waveguide dispersion is a change in signal velocity caused by differences in the refractive indices of a fiber core and its cladding. Finally, the water peak is an area of spectrum around 1380 nanometers where absorption by hydroxyl ions causes a spike of signal attenuation. Standard fiber has zero chromatic dispersion near 1310 nanometers because waveguide and material dispersion cancel out at that wavelength. This same effect can be shifted to 1550 nanometers by changes in fiber doping and or cladding. The combination of low scattering and absorption plus zero chromatic dispersion yields two wavelength windows where conditions for transmission are very favorable. There are three basic wavelengths used for optical communications over glass fiber with 850 nanometers being the first window of transmission and 1310 and 1550 being the second and third respectively. Over time, improvements in fiber optic manufacture have removed the water peak from the spectrum resulting in a continuum of frequencies that can be used for fiber optic transmission. This continuum is subdivided into bands as shown on the chart. The C-band is of particular interest in that it is an area of spectrum where erbium-doped fiber amplifiers are implemented. This technology allows direct amplification of light without an intermediate conversion to electrical energy. Just as frequency division multiplexing increases the signal carrying capacity of metallic conductors, it's possible to improve fiber optic signal capacity by simultaneously transmitting different wavelengths over the same fiber. The wavelength must remain within specified frequency limits and receivers need to be sufficiently sensitive to separately detect the individual streams of light. The initial implementation of wavelength division multiplexing in fiber used 1310 nanometer light in one direction and 1550 nanometer light in the other direction. This scheme is still in use, but improvements in laser transmitters and detectors, along with better fiber manufacturing technology, have greatly enhanced the number of wavelengths that can share a fiber. Starting at 1310 nanometers, new wavelength transmission bands were introduced, first focusing on the 1550 nanometer band for lower fiber attenuation. Finally, the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, standardized transmission wavelength bands for optical communication over the entire wavelength range between 1260 and 1675 nanometers, O, E, S, C, L, and U band, supporting wavelength division multiplexing or WDM techniques from 1260 to 1625 nanometers. Coarse Wavelength Division Multiplexing, or CWDM, is an enhancement to Wavelength Division Multiplexing. ITU-T G.694.2 specifies 18 wavelengths across 5 wavelength bands with center frequencies separated by 20 nanometers. 
Notice that the 1390 nanometer wavelength coincides with the fiber optic water peak area, E band of the spectrum, but this is not an issue as we will see later. In CWDM systems, the separation of frequencies is wide enough to allow a relatively large tolerance in the actual frequency of operation, allowing the lasers used for these systems to be economically manufactured and used in several communications applications for distances of up to 50 kilometers. In the same year, the ITU specified CWDM. It also defined dense wavelength division multiplexing, or DWDM. Unlike the specification for CWDM, ITU G.694.1 specifies DWDM wavelength spacing in terms of frequency rather than wavelength. The most commonly implemented DWDM systems use 100 GHz and 50 GHz spacing, which roughly equates to less than 3.2 nanometers between wavelengths. It was originally defined for operation in the C-band, where erbium-doped fiber amplifiers operate, although these systems have also been designed for other bands. The center wavelength in the DWDM C-band grid is 1553.52 nanometers. Due to the extremely narrow spacing between wavelengths, lasers used in DWDM systems must be tightly controlled, and this adds substantially to their cost. The advantage of single-mode fiber is its higher performance with respect to bandwidth and attenuation. With proper dispersion compensating components, a single-mode fiber can carry signals of 10 and 40 gigabits per second or above over long distances. The system carrying capacity may be further increased by injecting multiple signals of slightly differing wavelengths, WDM, into one fiber. The small core size, which typically ranges from a core of 8 to 12 microns with a 125 micron cladding, generally requires more expensive light sources and alignment systems to achieve efficient coupling. In addition, splicing and connectorization are also somewhat complicated, but nonetheless, for high-performance systems or for systems that are more than a few kilometers in length, single-mode fiber remains the best solution. The peak identified in the graph indicates that at the wavelength of 1383 nanometers, the presence of hydrogen and hydroxide ions in the fiber optic cable material causes an increase in attenuation. These ions result from the presence of water that enters the cable material through either a chemical reaction in the manufacturing process or as humidity in the environment. The variation of attenuation with wavelength due to the water peak for standard single-mode fiber optic cable occurs mainly around 1383 nanometers, but advances in the manufacturing processes of fiber optic cable have overcome the 1383 nanometer water peak and is known as Zero Water Peak ZWP OS2 Fiber. We earlier saw in the CWDM section that the 1390 nanometer wavelength coincided with the fiber optic water peak area E band of the spectrum. This is where the advantages of ZWP fiber come into play. The optical fiber network infrastructures installed today will typically see four generations of transmission systems over the network's expected lifetime. As recent history has shown, the amount of data traffic these networks will carry will increase dramatically and continuously. A completely open spectral transmission window from 1260 to 1625 nanometers for data transmission and up to 1650 nanometers for network monitoring is necessary in optical fiber cables in order to cope with this increasing growth. Cable type testing needs to extend to 1625 nanometers to guarantee cable performance at the higher wavelengths, where macro and micro bending loss may obscure the attenuation limits of cables under severe circumstances. The latest bend improved fibers G.657 support this optimization, particularly for demanding cable designs. In principle, optical fibers offer a tremendous amount of potential transmission bandwidth or capacity, currently used for a wide range of applications, such as long-distance data transmission, for example, internet traffic, fiber to the home, and cable television. Maximizing transmission capacity requires optimized fiber designs and communication techniques, which have been developed over the last decades in multiple steps, beginning with increased bit rates in telecommunications applications. 
Let's take a closer look at optical fiber's main parameters and characteristics. Light transmission in optical fiber uses three basic elements, a transmitter, a receiver, and a transmission medium that passes the signal from one to the other. The use of optical fiber introduces attenuation and dispersion into the system. Attenuation tends to increase the power requirements of the transmitter in order to meet the power requirements of the receiver. Dispersion, on the other hand, limits the bandwidth of the data that can be transmitted over the fiber. As the light traverses the fiber, it decreases in power level. The decrease in power level is expressed in decibels, dB, or as a rate of loss per unit of distance, decibels per kilometer. That completes Part 1. Please continue on to Part 2. Thank you.